Our guest this afternoon is Professor Tom Pettit, who will present on the Gutenberg Parenthesis, Discerning Historical Patterns in Media Technology, Cultural Production, and Perception. Professor Pettit is an associate professor at the University of Southern Denmark's Institute of Literature, Media, and Cultural Studies, where he lectures on literature and theater in the late medieval and early modern periods. His research is devoted to exploring a performance culture located in the triangle of literature, theater, and folklore. He has published many studies on customs, folk drama, and pageantry, legends and wonder tales. He has also worked extensively on medieval drama and Elizabethan theater, including folkloristic approaches to Shakespeare and Marlowe. His subject this afternoon is a so-called Gutenberg parenthesis, and the question of whether our emerging digital culture is partly a return to certain practices and ways of thinking that were central to human societies before the advent of the printing press and its many collateral media of cultural production. Our distinguished respondent, commentator, is Professor Peter S. Donaldson. Pete is professor of literature at MIT and author of two books, Machiavelli and the Mystery of State and Shakespearean Films, Shakespearean Directors as well as numerous publications on Shakespeare and film and digital media. He directs the MIT Shakespeare Electronic Archive, which since 1992 has used computers to develop new ways of studying Shakespeare across the media of text, image, and film. Related digital projects include Hamlet on the Ramparts, XMAS, a cross-media annotation system, and Shakespeare Performance in Asia, the first phase of a global Shakespeare video archive. Tom will present his argument for the first half hour. Pete will then respond, and we'll open the forum to discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Paradis. Uh, and my thanks, too, to you and to David Thorburn uh, for um, letting me come into this, uh, this forum, uh, and to Peter Donaldson for joining the, uh, the conversation. Brad to Brad for practical work. Thank you all for joining us on this uh, unseasonably warm afternoon. Uh, it will be a conversation. I'm, I'm trying to get used to the, the microphone. Uh, and, and I've got wires in places I don't often have wires. Uh, it's very appropriate. I'm, I'm a kind of a, in, a, in a cyborg condition, which, is, which, is, which we may be discussing later on. Um, <coughs> I've harassed the organizers into uh, allowing me to give a perhaps more substantial opening to the, uh, to the session than may normally be the case with your, with your forums. It's for two, reason, two reasons. It's uh, mainly they know I'm better at presenting ideas uh, than at discussing ideas. If you present me with a, an awkward question, I will have the answer, but it'll be as my plane comes into Copenhagen Airport early on Sunday morning. It'll be too late for you. I can email you my answer to question. But, um, Let's see how it goes. Uh, and also, I'd like this opportunity to establish uh, as a basis for the conversation exactly what I understand by the, uh, the Gutenberg parenthesis. Uh, it is other and more than uh, the phase of media history between oral tradition uh, and digital technology, which is suggested by the, um, by the title. And I hope you're all in sight of the... Uh, Oh, you're all, all inside of a handout, and the handout reproduces some of the uh, most essential of the small cluster of uh, PowerPoint slides, very simple elementary PowerPoint slides that I've uh, prepared for today's presentation. Now, the Gutenberg parenthesis has proved uh, an elegant uh, and effective uh, and therefore a, a, a quite provocative way uh, of formulating a thesis about the long-term history of media history. It has provoked a good deal of uh, positive response and a good deal of negative response since uh, I've uh, been uh, presenting the idea here, at, here, in, here in, uh, in Boston, in Cambridge. It's about the deep history of media, far beyond to today's new media, uh, the internet and digital technology, beyond even the old media, which is what new media people call film and television. <laughs> to, my, to my disappointment, we, we have a media studies, a fairly new media studies uh, department in, in University of Southern Denmark, and I was delighted to see that they were doing old media because I could say something about ballads and folk tales and legends from the Middle Ages, and lo and behold, old media was film and television. 
I'm very pleased that uh, attitudes to the history of media are otherwise uh, over here. So we're talking about effectively the, the prehistory from, from that perspective, the prehistory of, of the media uh, in the form of printing and writing and, uh, and, and the human voice as the means of communication. This idea about the parenthesis, it suggests that knowledge of what happened uh, in that relatively distant past uh, can be more than usually helpful uh, in understanding what's happening in the present and what may happen in the future, and vice versa. And for me, of course, it's the vice versa that's important. Uh, I do not present myself as an expert on the modern media. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in the, in the modern media. Uh, but if studying the modern media will help me better understand my own field, medieval Renaissance studies, which is what this parenthetical notion suggests, uh, I'm very happy to exchange uh, information and insights uh, with people who are experts in modern media, which is why I keep coming back uh, to MIT. The parenthesis image also explains why, as a student of Shakespeare, I've always felt more comfortable when I'm not studying Shakespeare uh, in working on folklore and in working on African-American culture, in working on the modern media, more so than when teaching regular canonical literature of the period in between of the parenthetical period of, of Milton and Pope and Swift and Wordsworth and Thackeray and Kipling and all those great masterpieces of the, of the Western canon. So those are, oh, and I'll say in passing, I will downplay Shakespeare in my initial presentation because I know jolly well we're going to have a jolly good conversation about, about Shakespeare in a moment. These are some of the places we may be going in the course of this forum, but I'd like to start with the help of my PowerPoints by exploring the potential value of the Gutenberg parenthesis idea uh, in suggesting answers to some important questions about the new media and their impact, which are currently the matter of urgent discussion. And as my per first PowerPoint shows, uh, in a very influential article in the Atlantic magazine in, in 2008, Nicholas Carr strikingly formulated what many people have been asking themselves, is Google making you stupid? And uh, he has a book coming out on the same subject uh, in, a few, in a month or so. Uh, and a couple of months ago, the American Edge Foundation, which poses an annual question to its star-studded panel uh, of academics and artists, unveiled its question for 2010, and which has subsequently been discussed and, and reported in most of the world's serious newspapers, how is the internet changing the way you think? Translated into my PowerPoint presentation in my own simplified terms, how is change in media technology affecting our, what I call our mind work, which is my plain man's term for cognition. I will say cognition in due course, but I say mind work to start, just to emphasize. I simply mean what happens in the mind, the, the work that the mind, the work that the mind does. Uh, of course, both these questions beg questions. The first one assumes that before Google, we weren't stupid. <laughs> and as someone who was there at the time, you have my personal assurance, we were. <laughs> what the question really means is, is Google making us stupid in a different way? which is effectively a rephrasing of the, uh, of the second question, how is the internet changing the way you think? Uh, and the Gutenberg parenthesis answer to both is, uh, is yes, it is changing the way we think, uh, and quite specific. The internet will ultimately make us think the way medieval peasants thought. Uh, or it's making us stupid, in a, or Google is making us stupid in a more medieval, rustic sort of a way, which may be an improvement on present conditions. Except, of course, both questions are problematic in assuming the influence only goes the one way. Uh, they are guilty of technological determinism, the cardinal sin of media studies. Influence can equally go the other way. Mind work can influence or determine the development of media technology, so we could ask with equal legitimacy is our stupidity making Google? How is the way you think changing the internet? Or even, was it a change in the way we think that created uh, the internet? Rephrasing, rephrasing their questions. And then thirdly, uh, finally, each of, each of these questions uh, omits a vital third ingredient. 
Media technology may influence mind work. Mind work may influence media technology. But either way, the influence is likely to pass through or show itself in uh, the cultural production, which is produced by that mind work and mediated by that technology. I mean the plays, the opera, the musicals, the films, the legends, the tales, the pulp fiction, the novels, poems, songs, jokes, sermons, serials and soaps, rumors and news reports, gossip, chat and twittering, uh, everything that it, is mediated by the media. And for some of us, those who think that, the, that with Hamlet, that the play is the thing, uh, those of you who are studying media in the sense of what the media mediate, uh, our, topic, our topic is the cultural production. The plays themselves, the stories themselves, the books themselves, the, the novels themselves, uh, and the mind work and the media and the technology are contexts for that production. I, I, I therefore rephrased them as contexts for cultural production uh, in, my, in that, current, uh, that current PowerPoint. Context we need to know more about in order better to appreciate the content and the form and the meaning of that cultural production. So my formulation of the edge question would be, uh, how is the internet changing the way you create, changing the way you write? How is it changing the way you produce words? And the Gutenberg parenthesis answer would be, it's making me create a bit more like Shakespeare. Which brings us back to the historical dimension. We are evidently in the middle uh, of a revolution in communications, which is manifestly impacting on cultural production and prompting these questions about its impact on cognition. Started in the 20th century with uh, recording, with sounds and film, with, with, with sound and film recording, multiplied by radio and television, uh, and now supplemented and enhanced by the internet and digital technology. Uh, and there's a common theme in commentary that these developments constitute not just something new, but the end of something old, uh, that they are a challenge to the dominance of print and the book and reading. Uh, and I just, there, there, are, there, are, there are now publications with titles like The End of Books, The Gutenberg Elegies, The Fate of Reading in an Electronic Age, uh, The End of the Reign of the Book. There's a collection of studies called Beyond the Book, and one of the articles in it is called We Are Already Beyond the Book. The book is dead, with an extra subtitle, Long Live the Book, uh, a, a, a heretical voice in this chorus. Uh, and famously, Jeff, Jeff Gomez's The Print is Dead, uh, books in our digital uh, uh, age. And of course, talking about the end of the book, I'll, I'll wait until it goes away. If, it, if it's for me, say I'm busy. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Talking about the end of the book uh, invites us, of course, to uh, juxtapose that with the beginning of the book, with the emergence of printing and, and, and the printed book. And another uh, one of the uh, influential works on this field, in this field is Peter Schillingberg's study from 2006, uh, which is entitled From Gutenberg to Google where his thesis is, we are in the infancy, we are now in the infancy of a textual revolution comparable to the one initiated by the invention of printing from movable type in the 15th century. Two revolutions, Gutenberg revolution, Google revolution, uh, three phases, the two, revolution, the two revolutions taking us from one level of technology to another in, in, the, in mediating context, uh, from a low technology of personal face-to-face oral mediation with some writing, uh, a step upwards in technology with Gutenberg into an intermediate technology with textual mediation by the printed book, and then the Google revolution to a higher technology with the electronic media, digital technology, the internet, and CMC, computer-mediated uh, communication, which suggests, of course, and juxtaposing, the, in, its, uh, in itself, that suggests juxtaposing these two revolutions should be mutually uh, enlightening. Uh, we can studying the Gutenberg revolution can help us better understand the Google revolution. Uh, in a 1995 position paper for the Rand Corporation, James DeWar, it was entitled, the, by DeWar, was called The Information Age and the Printing Press, Looking Backward to See Ahead. The book historian Roger Chartier uh, sees that, can see that one revolution can help us 
uh, to understand the other. And conversely, from the, present, from the present to the past, we can use, I can use the Google Revolution to better understand the Gutenberg Revolution and what it meant to Shakespeare and others. Uh, and uh, people who work in my field, uh, Arthur Morotti and Michael Bristol, uh, have edited a collection of studies on print, manuscript, and performance, the changing relations of the media uh, in early modern England. Uh, they, they say they will study the complex interactions back then in Shakespeare's time between a technologically advanced culture of the printed book and a still powerful traditional culture based on the spoken word, word spectacle and manuscript. Looking back from our own era, looking back from now, from the Google age to the, to the Gu Gutenberg revolution, looking back from our own transitional moment as we attempt to negotiate the shift from typographic to electronic and visual media. And there are others. Uh, there are universities who have sought grants on the basis of juxtaposing this modern revolution with the 16th century revolution, with the Renaissance revolution, uh, with an aim to, to the reciprocal enlightenment on, on both sides. And of course, Marshall McLuhan uh, uh, famously uh, has referred to the Gutenberg galaxy uh, as the uh, name for the, for, the, for the phrase in between, uh, and that those two revolutions can be compared in their impact on the nature of, 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 of human thinking and many other things. Uh, there others have done the same. Walter Ong, also famously, has developed this notion of secondary, oral, or secondary, uh, secondary orality, uh, that we are moving we are moving into something that resembles even more the past. Uh, we are going through a period uh, of print, moving into a secondary orality, which takes us in many ways back uh, to the primary orality of the pre-print period. And that's moving us on to something else, uh, because this is the notion that not, we are not merely moving up in technology on into a third phase, uh, but that third phase of uh, media history is taking us back uh, in many ways to the the period between. Uh, another Renaissance scholar, Leah Marcus, in a striking study called Cyberspace Renaissance, uh, has noted that uh, in, in, uh, in modern electronic editions, uh, texts are becoming more fluid, less stable, more subject to intervention uh, by people who copy them, and that therefore uh, they are, that, that situation is taking us back to how things were uh, in the age of manuscripts, in the age, uh, in the age of, of the Shakespeare period, uh, where texts were not as stable as they became in the meantime. Uh, I some of you may recall from the conference here last year, uh, the program borrowed a very effective uh, cartoon from the Denver Post. Uh, suggesting that we are moving back, uh, the future is taking us back uh, into the past. Uh, the suggestion that uh, uh, the, the, the suggestion that, that mailing and tweeting, uh, if that's the right term, uh, are a reversion to the limited, the limited communicative capacities uh, of, of stone tablets. So we are, the future is taking us back to the past. Uh, and uh, the most important figure in this field, perhaps, is John Foley. Uh, from the Center for Oral Tradition uh, at the University of Missouri, uh, who has instigated this massive project, Pathways of the Mind, uh, with a splendid website uh, which explores uh, the similarities uh, between pre-literate orality, the, uh, the world of oral traditions, uh, and the post-Gutenberg the post uh, phenomenon of digital texts, which are, uh, which are accessible on the internet. Uh, John Foley has said, has talked about the fundamental similarities between humankind's oldest and most pervasive communications medium, oral tradition, on the one hand, and humankind's newest medium, the internet, that the two are uh, reasonably juxtaposed. And then, uh, finally, my colleague, Lars Ola Sauerberg at the University of Southern Denmark, came, came up with this uh, delightful phrase, the, the Gutenberg parenthesis, uh, suggesting that, uh, as in a sentence, we have been through our sentence, the sentence which is the history of the media, uh, has been interrupted uh, by the age of print, by a, a printing, a book phase, uh, and that insofar as we are leaving that book phrase, uh, we are going back 
uh, we are going back to the situation before that, uh, without any implications that the period in between was a waste of time or, or going in the wrong direction or misguided, it's not parenthesis in any pejorative sense, it's like in a sentence, if you're speaking a sentence or writing a sentence, you interrupt for a while with a second thought to add to your first thought, you then resume the first thought at the end of the parenthesis, and the sentence goes on, but that sentence will be irrevocably changed by what has happened, well, at least I think so, uh, in, the, uh, in the parenthesis in between. It has not, it has not been a, a digression or something not worthwhile. It's also very appropriate, of course, in the sense that the parenthesis as an idea and the parenthesis, the brackets as, as symbols, uh, were themselves the products of the age of print and were introduced and appreciated in the, uh, in the, in the, in the 16th century. I have all kinds of um, qualifications to this, uh, to this picture uh, in the sense that uh, it doesn't all happen in 1600. It, it is very gradual. It comprises many different aspects. Some things happen at one time and some things happen at another. And when I say 1600 and 2000, uh, I'm referring, if you like, to mainstream, to the mainstream culture of Western Europe and subsequently of North America. Other There'll be other timetables for subcultures within cultures, uh, and there'll be different timetables for different cultures, which is why folklore, when I study folklore, I'm effectively studying uh, the culture of people who have not yet entered the Gutenberg parenthesis, even though the Main, the mainstream, the, the, the majority culture around them has entered the, uh, uh, the Gutenberg parenthesis. This is also why we may come back to this uh, African-American uh, vernacular culture is so interesting or can be seen in a new light uh, from this perspective. In, in America, there have been different subcultures. They have entered this parenthesis uh, at different times, and there's been interesting discrepancies between them uh, as, a con as a consequence. In the little time I've got left, I'd like to, that is the basic situation, I'd like to take a bit of a look at uh, exactly what it is uh, that characterizes the, uh, uh, the parenthesis. In, in the time that I have, I'll, I'll focus on what's happening in the parenthesis, uh, but the implication is that before the parenthesis uh, and after the parenthesis, things were different, uh, and they were different uh, in the in the same way. And uh, as far as I can, I'll, be, I'll try and be uh, consistent and sort of move slowly up the diagram uh, in those various uh, levels. This is, this is the overall situation. Just focus on, if you like, on, on the central part. It's extraordinarily simple, uh, but I seem to find patterns. It seems that there, there have been changes round about 1600, round about 2000. There have been changes under all three headings under the heading of the mediating context and culture production and the cognitive context, uh, and they seem to be the same changes. And the second change seems to reverse the first change. So as I say, this is, this is nothing uh, pretentiously intellectual. It's, it, it, it boils down to some very, uh, some very basic things. So with regard, for example, to the mediating context, the key word is containment. Words have been imprisoned uh, in the Gutenberg parenthesis. If one, if one thinks of all the, uh, the ways words have been regimented, thanks to this technology, words are regimented into lines of the same length and the same height. Those lines are uh, structured into a block of text. That, that block of text is surrounded by a margin uh, within a page. Uh, those pages are folded and gathered then they are stitched together, then several gatherings are put together in a book and glued together, uh, and that book is bound and then put in covers. It may then be put into a dust jacket and it may be put into a, a slip case, or in some cases it may be provided with metal clasps uh, to stop the words from getting out, it seems. Uh, an extraordinary level, an extraordinary level of containment and uh, this is not time, but we do the same thing with letters. Uh, when you write a letter to someone, you write it on the paper, you fold the paper, you put the paper into an envelope, it therefore becomes an enclosure. And you seal the envelope and, and, and send it off. We are, we, are, we are imprisoning words. We're putting words into things. And with regard to printing, how do they get there? Uh, the words get into those containers uh, by 
something we call the press. And there's a very good reason why it's called a press. It was uh, Gutenberg, Guten, the Gutenbergs didn't make many changes to existing machinery. Uh, the press was previously, that same device was previously used for pressing juice out of olives and grapes uh, and into barrels, into bottles. It's just a question of slightly adapting the technology. Uh, so whereas previously that press was used for, for getting juice out of, out of vegetables, out of, out of olives uh, and grapes into, ba into barrels, uh, so now we are using, or the Gut Gutenberg used the press uh, to press the words into, onto the pages, into the book, into the, into the container, into, into volumes which have contents. The whole, the whole vocabulary is that of uh, containment. And then just to finish that off, when we buy one of those books full of words, uh, even we are, if you like, confined within the book because a lot of those books are designed for what's called immersive reading. We ourselves, we ourselves, we immerse ourselves in that text and we are lost in the book, is the, uh, is the conventional phrase. So it's a question, the Gutenberg parenthesis is a question of... Uh, confining, containing words. And uh, th there's not really time for this, but uh, it, one thing that makes this change all the more striking, or, or may, but may uh, make the connection with Gutenberg less firm, uh, is that similar things seem to be happening in other forms of production, in other, for, in other, in other, in other media. Uh, it all happens round about the same time. Uh, words get confined in books round about the same time that plays get confined to stages. Plays weren't performed on, on, on sort of stages necessarily, and not that kind of stage. And stages get confi confined into theatres. Uh, and uh, performances occur sort of in venues. Uh, music is performed in, uh, concert in, in concert halls, opera houses, in orchestra pits. Music is printed in behind staves, in staves behind bars, and, and you need the right key uh, to get them out again. There is this extraordinary influence, uh, this sense, sense of containment. That was the media themselves, uh, and uh, it has its impact on what is produced for those media uh, and, and communicated in those media. Uh, and uh, I, will, I will use this diagram to, to summarize that. It looks just about right. Uh, if you like, that was the, the media contained, but then the, the product itself is contained. It is separate. It is cut off from others. This is an indication of what's going on in, in, in this diagram. Uh, the, the squares indicate that uh, this period, this same transition sees the emergence of something we take for granted, and that is the individual work. Uh, the, the, the notion that, there, that, that, that uh, a, a verbal product has to be a work, a story with a beginning and a middle and an end. The notion that a piece of music has to, has to last a certain amount of time. Uh, the notion that a picture is one picture. It is a picture of just one thing and doesn't crawl all over a wall and, and, and involve all kinds of sequences of action. Uh, and, that, and that works are complete. The, the notion that a given, a given work uh, isn't a fragment, it has a beginning and end. It doesn't just kind of uh, wander on. It, doesn't, it isn't just stopped arbitrarily, as things might have been before uh, and, and as things may, may, well, be, may well be after. Uh, works become isolated. They are not based on sources. They don't plagiarize earlier works. They are not much imitated. They're much influenced by other works. They are original. They belong to the man who creates them. And then when they are created, they are passed on, they are mediated uh, with as little change as possible. Before and after the, uh, the parenthesis, change was normal. Interference was normal. Uh, works weren't defended from external interference by some kind of uh, imaginary, imaginary war. So there's, I'm summarizing uh, brutally now, just, just to get to cover the, the whole ground uh, for the first time around. The media are contained. The works are contained. I, I forgot to say, I, I don't think I knew that the idea of a framed picture was so late. We take that for granted, too. Pictures were framed at roughly the same time that words were enclosed in books.
And then finally, the last big topic is I anticipate that there's some connection. See, I won't say which way the connection is. There are changes at the same time in the way we look at the world, the way that people see the world. Uh, this is the cognition term that I uh, was hesitant to use earlier on, but uh, the, the way people perceive the world, the way... Well, let's, let's go on to my main example. Uh, bodies. Okay, this is not me. I forgot to say at the start, a lot of, a lot of this isn't my own work. Uh, I'm, I'm in a pre-parenthetical or post-parenthetical mode where I, I, re, I, I redeploy ideas from other people. Uh, and this too. I came across this. this is, these are my own diagrams. But this notion, I came across this extraordinary idea in a French book, a, a book by a Swiss scholar called Guillaume Bolens, La Logique du corps articulaire. Uh, Guillaume Bolens detects a, a very interesting shift in the way we see bodies. And she also links it to the difference between orality and literacy. B bodies are how we see them. We construct. We don't see the, word, the world as it is. We perceive the world, and we represent and treat the world in terms of preconceived structures, structures and shapes in our minds. Those shapes change, and the changes seem to be correlated to these changes in media technology and, and cultural production. And say, so with regard to the body, the body, the body is how we see it, and how we see it changes. And this theory will say that uh, I've chosen some sort of... These are illustrations rather than documentation. Uh, but uh, the, ba the basic point is that within the parenthesis, this is Bolenz's theory, within the, within the parenthesis is my term, of course, but uh, in the age of literacy and print, uh, the body is seen as an envelope. We represent the body, we perceive the body, we treat the body uh, as an envelope, uh, and the well-being of the body is uh, dependent on the integrity of that envelope so that uh, there is no, no improper ingress or egress into the body or from the body. And our culture, again, this corresponds in our culture, uh, to obsession. The period of the Gutenberg parenthesis strangely corresponds to the, the notions of etiquette. All these things we were told to do and not to do with our bodies, all that upbringing... Don't spit, don't burp, breathe through your mouth, eat with your, or eat with your mouth open, don't gape, don't guffaw, cover your mouth when you cough, cover your nose when you sneeze, keep your stomach in, keep your legs and your knees together. All that, all that business came in, came in with the book, it seems extraordinary. Uh, thing, things change. I mean, etiquette changes, attitudes change, but the, the idea that our bodies are envelopes and that it, it is the control of that envelope which is essential to the body... Even the way we dress, dressing, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into the sordid details, but uh, there is an awful containment of the body by changes in clothing, not least undergarments, uh, roughly at the same time. Get on, I'll move on. Uh, I've got two, two small points, to, or two, two remaining points, I can do them very quickly. The same thing applies to space. There's another correlation. The way we see space seems to have changed over the same period and perhaps in the same way. Uh, the way we look at the world, the way, the way we make maps, the way we orient ourselves uh, in the physical environment, uh, I've provided you, again, for illustration rather than proof. In the Gutenberg parenthesis, the world is seen in terms of enclosures. We look at nations, at communities, at gardens, at estates, at houses things that people own, keep us, keep other people out of our enclosure. Whereas before and after, uh, the world was seen in terms of movement, of avenues and junctures. And it just turned out rather neatly. My, my illustration is concerns navigation. In the parenthesis, navigation uh, is on ch uses charts printed in books, and navigation takes the form of orienting oneself in relation to space, an enclosed space. One charts one's positions on a map. Whereas prior to that, people navigated, or navigation books, navigation aids, uh, were instructions on when to, when to go to port and when to go to starboard, 
what, what landmark to aim for. These are pilot books. These are routiers, rutters. <coughs> Navigation took the form of following instructions on when to turn left, when to turn right, when to head for uh, a given landmark, and say it seems to be returning uh, in the vision of the world around us that uh, we have with GPS. And then my, fi my final point, I'll just, I'll just mention it without going further into it, uh, it but it, it's probably perhaps too big for today. But f the final containment, I'm accusing the... I'm accusing the book, I'm accusing the Gutenberg parenthesis of containing everything, of making us see, see everything in terms of containments. And the last and the biggest uh, is categories. Categories. The notion that we see the world in terms of categories, that there are, that people can be categorized in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of species all those big divides, uh, that wasn't always the case. Medieval medicine distinguished three genders, male, female, and hermaphrodite. No great, no great fuss. We are approaching that perception with great difficulty and pain uh, in our time. Human, medieval thought didn't distinguish too sharply between man and animal, man and material, man and machine. And again, we are, we are now approaching a kind of pre-Gutenberg pre medieval notion that uh, borders are crossable, that things overlap. Uh, and, uh, well, that is, that is my conclusion uh, for that part. The my answer under that last heading is that the Internet will make us less categorical in the way we perceive the world. It'll make us less panicky, less uh, worried about distinctions between the human and the divine, the human and the machine, the human and the animal, the living and the dead, the black and the white, the male and the female, between writing and speech. It'll make us less aggressive about transgressions of categories. So in a way, when I, when I say we are going back the internet will make us think like medieval peasants. Uh, I think uh, that there may be some, some healthy aspects to it. I'll stop there, Jan. Thanks very much. Turn it over to Pete. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, it was a little unclear exactly w whether this would be a three-way discussion or <laughs> response and uh, how much it would have to deal with Shakespeare, so sort of winging it a little bit. But I think that, uh, first of all, I, want, I, I wanted to thank uh, Tom for his wonderful presentation. I should say, even its exaggerations I thought were healthy and uh, helpful and help us to get a sense of when and how the book and the regime of the book and other such totalizing regimes can weigh upon creativity. Uh, I know Tom's already in advance uh, said there's another side to, it, to this and that books, uh, books are not uh, merely engines for the compression and, and restriction and policing of meaning. And indeed there are. Uh, but I found this a very, very helpful talk and I, and I love the, uh, the metaphors and the visualizations that he brought that he brought to this. Um, I thought Tom was going to speak about Shakespeare and about the sort of, what would you say, the arch fetishized book, which is the Shakespeare folio. And maybe he will a little bit later, but maybe. Uh, are you going to talk about that later? Or? Your responses. Yeah, oh, well, OK, cause, but I'm going to start with it. <laughs> so uh, and here's an example, because this was the start, in some ways, it was the symbol of what a lot of people, actually, that's a fa facsimile. What do you think of the? Um, 
collected works of Shakespeare, which this is not, this is a facsimile uh, edition, but the big book with all the plays by an authoritative editor and commentary by authoritative scholars. Uh, and it went along with the social practice of the Shakespeare lecturer. We don't actually have Shakespeare lecturers at MIT. We have discussion sections and other kinds of things like that. And even uh, Shakespeare students writing multimedia hyper uh, text essays on Shakespeare in the in these days, but when I began, that was the figure of the authoritative uh, professor at the front of a room like me right now, uh, with a hundred people, more or less the official interpreter of a sacred book, which had a unique and um, unitary meaning, uh, or if it didn't, the aim was to uh, was to come as close to that as possible, which had an originary and authorized printed form, which if the historical facts did not actually make it possible uh, to specify that form, at least that's what one was after as an editor. And so, but um, in the mind of a generation of people who went through this regime, and it's still common in many parts of the world, like perhaps uh, very close to here in cer certain ways, uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> other universities. Um, but there was an urge in the profession that kind of peaked in the mid-1980s, and it had a number, uh, in the Shakespeare profession, it had a number of inputs. Uh, one was, was that uh, the, um, uh, the fact of variation of texts, right? Half of Shakespeare's plays are, uh, appear in two different versions. Uh, they're not always very different. Sometimes they're, they're only, only uh, what would you say, nominally different, uh, no, no major differences. But, uh, but half of the plays appear in quarto, which is small, and in folio, which is that size. Uh, after Shakespeare's death, 36 plays published after Shakespeare's death, in 16, six years after, seven years after, 1623. During Shakespeare's lifetime, about half the plays appear in quarto. And sometimes there are surprising differences. For, for example, uh, uh, to be or not to be, uh, that is the question. One of the most famous lines appears in the first quarter as, to, uh, to be or not to be, I, there's the point. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine. It's a, it's a good example of variation that's potentially meaningful because instead of it being the question, it's more or less the point and uh, the answer. And so, but, and there are profound differences. Hamlet is a, is a play for which there are three significantly different uh, texts. Uh, first quarto, second quarto, and, and folio. King Lear has two. Othello has fascinating differences between the 1622 uh, quarto and the folio in hundreds of individual words. Unlike King Lear and uh, Hamlet, it's not a matter of whole scenes or, or long passages, but individual words seem to have been changed. And we don't always know which way, since the date of publication is not necessarily the date of the underlying document. So, uh, so in, in fact, uh, in textual studies, they use the word ad omission, because you don't know whether something was added or omitted if, you're, if, you, if you don't know the dates of the text or the, or the, pro, or, or the uh, stemma. You don't know how they descended from one another. So that was one thing. The text varied a lot. And the knowledge of this variation was hidden in impossibly tiny print at the end of the book uh, that nobody ever used. And you would need a little bit of a course to, to understand. Th uh, that, that was one, one, uh, one thing. The other was the question of performance. How do, we, how do we acknowledge adequately the fact that Shakespeare came to Stratford as an actor, made his way up as a, as a writer? Yes, he, he took on the airs of a gentleman and wrote sonnets, and they were uh, published uh, uh, prob with probably with more uh, more supervision or more intention than some of the other um, texts of Shakespeare, uh, but he was a man of the theater, and in the theater, uh, a variation is uh, is, uh, is inescapable uh, because theatrical productions vary from one uh, day to the next, right? From one performance to the next, they can't help but vary that way, and of course they vary even perhaps more grossly, in one production to the next, in one language to the next, in one culture taking up the text and, and understanding it a different way. So variations seem to be, in many, many ways, cultural, textual, performative, uh, something that needed acknowledging. And, um, and some of the steps taken, and I think this would, would be a very good example of, 
uh, words of the idea that words were being constricted in a certain kind of way and that we could loosen the bonds uh, of the parenthesis, we didn't use the word at the time, uh, and, uh, and, and create something uh, with more flow, more inclusion, and, and more honesty to the fact of what the human labor of writing a play uh, is like and how subject it is to variation and to imperfection on all sorts of levels, whether it's the imperfection of the writer uh, who can come up with a word like princox that no one has ever heard before or since, and somehow that gets into the text, or, or the performers or the editors. And so it, it seemed difficult within the, within the margins of the book to give adequate, adequate form to this. And so I wanted to also look at another kind of book very, for a minute, which is, well, a uh, very um, well-known scholar started trying to find alternate, uh, alternate ways within the uh, limit of the bound book to give readers access to the fact of variation. They didn't all work out. This is, a, this is by my friend uh, Michael Warren uh, at Santa Cruz, and this is the, um, the parallel King Lear. Now, he thought the way to, to really represent the facts of King Lear was to take the first quarto and the folio version and to put them side by side. But since the books are of different sizes, you had, he had to develop this method, very complicated technological method called cut, um, cut line um, um, facsimile, right? So first you take a, f a picture of the page, then you cut it so the reader can cross right over from, uh, for the comparable parts of the, of the quarto and folio, right? Uh, but they're of different sizes, so there's white spaces in between. Um, and very, very hard to read. Uh, legibility was a great deal of a problem. So what Michael did for the next stage was to uh, publish this book along with unbound fascicles of the three texts so that you could shift them and, and compare them as we were reading. He thought it was rather awkward. Uh, so uh, he actually... Um, in a sense, renounced the practice of editing at all within the, within the confines of the codex or the facsimile. And he joined our early efforts to find a way out of this, uh, uh, out of the confines of the book. Uh, he, so he joined our team at MIT um, in, uh, in the hopes of finding a way of representing this variation. And I, I, so I wanted to give you just a few examples of what the kind of thing we were doing then. And I wanted to maybe preface it by saying, uh, parentheses, uh, um, it's curious. We've been talking about the Gutenberg parentheses, and I kept thinking for the first time, I hadn't thought it, about it until Tom was talking, that there's a kind of parenthesis around the period about, uh, in, uh, that I'm about to exemplify, which is uh, the period of hypertext, hypermedia, and standalone hypertext, hypermedia. Well, as a, uh, the novelist Robert Coover declares the end of books in 1994 in the New York Times, and in 2002, uh, you still can get it online, thanks to Nick uh, keeping, it, keeping it alive online. Um, the uh, article, um, uh, I think it's the, the end of hypertext, or it's about the fading of the golden age of hypertext, which lasts some vanishingly small period from maybe 1984 to 2002. So they have the hypertext parenthesis as well. Uh, and we may have the Google parenthesis, because as free as we think it is, we may find that it's very confining in the end. Who knows? We don't know. Uh, but there'll always be this tension between something that um, confines in its own way and a larger reality. Uh, I, I was, I was going to quote uh, Solomon's prayer at the completion of the temple is something like, but can, uh, but can this house ever hold uh, the immensity of the Lord? So, so you know, you have uh, something completed, but with the recognition that there's no way that the confinement is going to work. And that's part of the point. You know, part of the point is that there's a great deal outside the effort to confine. So um, this is what we started. We started with three faces for our, this is originally a standalone project on uh, workstations. And we, we actually have the uh, developer and designer, uh, Ed Moriarty, who uh, some of this work is. I think much of it, uh, maybe all of it, but uh, a, a great deal. Uh, we're grateful to him. And we did this was kind of a secret reason. It's because the three faces of Shakespeare actually represent three different states of the engraved portrait because Shakespeare was important enough, uh, it was important enough to get this right. So the plate was removed and worked on and put back. 
twice. So, and uh, I, most people can't tell. Uh, there's a hair strand loose in one. Uh, probably two. We don't have the resolution to tell which one it is. And in one, his head looks like uh, John the Baptist on a platter. And uh, uh, then uh, the artist put in some shading so he wouldn't look quite so cut off from his, from his body. Intellectually looking fellow, a prosperous uh, gentleman type with a big brain and, uh, and a rock star of the medium of print. Uh, no one had ever had a full page portrait of themselves uh, on, the, on the frontispiece. Uh, they, uh, they, they had front, uh, full face portraits. Uh, Edmund Spencer's works had a portrait, but it took up a tiny part of the page. Uh, Shakespeare was a pop star in the sense that he, he dominated what the book was. And, and if you've seen, if we could open that and show you. Um, but you couldn't get beyond the fact of variation, even in this medium. So we, we based our work on the idea uh, that it was uh, the variation, the struggling against the attempt to confine words uh, that needed addressing by, by displaying their variation. But also their variation into media dreamt of and undreamt of in Shakespeare's time. We wanted to have the text relate to it, the, its um, afterlife in art and illustration and in uh, videos from our own time. Of course, we ran into lots of copyright problems. Some of them are not actually solved even now, uh, as would be no surprise to you. Uh, so, so this is an example of what you might call the ex expanded book way of trying to break out of that parenthesis, a mode in some ways which is uh, superseded even on, in our own work, but we tried to do it well. And so we had a, a, a choice among el electronic texts on the left. So there's the principle of uh, multiplicity. And on the right, um, you click and you could get either, uh, it, it's a little hard to read on the screen, um, folio, which is their folio facsimile, and you can blow it up and stuff. And, uh, but you could also get the earlier uh, quarto editions, if they existed, of a given play and juxtapose them with a, with a folio, or click on an art field, and it would give you a, a thumbnail, a stream of thumbnails. You could click on those, and you get art, all, all linked to either that exact line, or as we sort of compromise, every two or three lines, right, we decide where, where the resources went. But notice it was still text-centric, right? So we're kind of radiating out from the Shakespeare text. So one way to look at it was that we're, in fact, creating a, a more monstrous a kind of uh, a, a worship of the author by you know, having, being able to move out from one line to various resources. Uh, but we thought of it as uh, liberating. And I think it is in some ways. It gives you a lot of information about what different lines have uh, meant. Now, you notice, um, maybe you didn't know. Is it, I don't know if that's visible. But I wanted to show you. I've chosen, and some of you have heard me talk when I was my, my favorite example. Uh, the first uh, letter, the first phoneme, well, it isn't really. It's a, it's a uh, uh, it, yeah, it is. It's the first word spoken um, in Shakespeare play in the folio, because the tempest comes first. It's the word boson. And the compositor who was working that day, a compositor E, who's the, the worst of the five, uh, managed to put the letter upside down, a big decorated uh, the big decorated letter that would be, it would be the first thing that you saw when you turned to an actual play. So, uh, so then going back, what this edition allows you to do is look at any of the four. There are four separate states. Even within the folio, there are four separate states of the first page. You know, and one of them contains this egregious error. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's not, a, not what they call a significant variation, since you know which way the letter really ought to go. But it also accesses a kind of uh, materiality of the book, because uh, the, uh, the paradox here is that this miserable copy, this must be one of the worst pages of the folio in existence, is, is all Foxton damaged and uh, other places water damaged. Uh, and it has this, this awful typo, uh, was laboriously uh, cut out and repasted into a full page and bound. And the join between the uh, bad copy that the collector had and the book was disguised with a red line all around it. So even early on, uh, as the 18th century, you, you had the fetishization of the Shakespeare text so that even a bad one 
was something that people were struggling and paying immense amounts of money. So I just want to, this, this is an example of the uh, first quarter of Hamlet. We, we, we photographed all seven of the uh, individual copies, only seven exist, and you can click on those. Then we have a, a, an art collection of 1,500 images from uh, 1,700 to 1,900. This is a copying uh, photograph of uh, Hamlet in the skull. We, uh, uh, this is illustrating the line, alas, poor York, I knew him, Horatio. But there are others, and we found that maybe 30% of the illustration in that period was comical. Well, so here's a guy uh, holding a rather gigantic Neanderthal skull. This is 19th century. And then in the corner, there's a little chicken um, rooster meditating on death. And uh, <laughs> he does, he's got a, a skull, you know, so a, a more recently deceased uh, comrade. And he stands in much uh, greater danger of immediate death than the uh, actor Harrison Wolf uh, with his giant head kind of imitating Shakespeare's Head. So uh, many, many comic versions is one of the things you find when you study variation in, in the text and in their performance. Uh, we also wanted to have video. We had a little trouble getting copyright, i.e. we got oh, uh, uh, permissions. But we did get permissions from uh, Mrs. Burton for the, uh, uh, for, to display the uh, Richard Burton Hamlet. It's a very fine one. And we wanted to at least exemplify the concept. The same skull as was Yannick's skull. The king's jester. What is this? The map. Let me see. <laughs> Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Marisha. Okay, and then uh, we, we uh, another one we got was the Swedish um, television version directed by Ragnar Lith and uh, with uh, Stellan Selsgaard as, um, as Hamlet. I'll just play this for a second. So these have become the only words in Swedish that I know. So, okay, <laughs> now, uh, having, having done that, you know, we, we, we came to a point in our work where we had the opportunity to expand, and we decided not to expand that model, um, at least not now, I mean, the original model. Uh, and there were, there were certain reasons about how expensive uh, it is to hand link thousands and thousands of lines to one another, which may be more uh, possible and easier to automate today. But we, what, what we realized was we wanted something that was a little less, uh, there's two things, right? a little less text-driven and more performance-driven, and also something that would uh, uh, deal with Shakespeare as interpreted elsewhere in the world. And we had a very fortunate conjunction of um, the possibility of a grant to do this with the um, development of a collection already taking place uh, in, uh, in um, uh, uh, our collaborator Alex Wang's collection that he was developing at Penn State, for which he'd already begun to get online permissions before he had a way of uh, putting them up. So we're now uh, partners in this enterprise. And, uh, and this is a, a video-centric archive, right? So it does not actually contain a text of Shakespeare, uh, but it contains, um, at present, uh, uh, 25 to 30 full, um, full video records of <coughs> of productions from a number of countries, uh, notably Japan, Taiwan, um, People's Republic, and with um, uh, Korea coming, so uh, East Asia. And so that, so that is what we decided was a good move, to take two steps away from the domination of the text. And this also, um, th this also converged with the understanding, the changing of, understanding of Shakespeare in Asia. I mean, one way of looking at it is that like, in, in Japan in, in 1905 and 1910, uh, they would send people to Russia to study how Stanislavski put on the cherry orchard or put on another kind of a play and imitate the exact gestures. By 1996, uh, these Asian countries had become centers of innovation in Shakespeare, and my own view is that unrivaled centers of innovation. Uh, you know, far more interesting things happening 
in Japan or in um, Taiwan or China uh, than in Great Britain as far as opening up the text to new understandings. So that's what we wanted to do. This is, this is one of our interfaces for that. Uh, but another one is this, and it's a matrix, you know. And so and in our second version, we're going to start with some version of a video matrix. And you click on one, and you're brought into the video performance itself. Um, a, a second stage, the randomized, the filling of the matrix will be randomized, uh, will be different and randomized. Third stage, it won't be randomized, but it will conform as these sophisticated online things now do to your own choices, to your own interests, to the pathways that you may be, uh, that you may be following. And the third thing, which I can't exemplify because we're working on it now, is that we wanted to, we wanted to find a place for sort of scholarly Shakespeare and serious archives within a media ecology that includes examples of interactive or community uses of, of video that far transcend what we could do in quantity and also, frankly, in design of a space in which ordinary people can put up their material, enjoy it, communicate it around it. Uh, and of course, I'm thinking of the video sites and YouTube in particular. So one of our, the goals of the new project is to be open, not only to try to be open to other cultures, to a variation to, in performance, but also to the decentered world of uh, contribution and communication of, um, of the contemporary uh, social aspects of the web. And, um, and the, at least the first start will be to have a YouTube connection within the archive where people can post their YouTube playlists and where we also uh, engage a wider public in uh, sifting material that would be useful for uh, for online essays or enlarging the material we have. So this is just um, a taste of ways in which we've tried to go beyond that um, uh, parenthesis, but at the same time, I think with the realization that I, I don't know if we can say that we've en now entered a freer world um, in every way. You know, there's going to be more restrictions and more ways in which uh, what is it? Um, one of one of the I think the Fulger Education Department's books is called uh, "Freeing Shakespeare's Words," and that's that's a title very much in in um, consonance with Tom's. So I wanted to give an example of ways in which one could try to go beyond this. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, Pete. Um, excellent uh, combination of. Uh, presentations here because uh, the one has the abstract theory and the other has the concrete examples. And I think it's very exciting work. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is uh, open the session to discussion. William, uh, actually, we would like people to speak into the uh, microphone. So I could, OK, It'd be excellent. So indeed, thank you both um, also for raising the methodological, fundamental methodological issue here of um, how high to fly. Take the 300-foot route or the 50,000. Yields very different data. I mean, Pete, you did a great job of showing the incredible variability of a, of a so-called stable era. Um, and Tom, pattern recognition is a tricky thing, and I think I want to address my question to you. The parenthesis. I can take a lot of the same symptoms you've offered and read them I'm sure anyone can sort of come up with, but you know, just to say, the, if we think about before the 15th century, we could talk about an era of embodiment. Yeah, there's containment, but it's containment through the body. The body writes the word. The church, the body of the church is the storage facility for it. Uh, cartography is very much about embodied sites. We could think about the uh, period after the 15th century in terms of, we could capture that in a word like the algorithmic, right, the ability to fix to get precise mathematical meaning. Three-point perspective is an invention of this as much as the book, and you pointed to the frame. M my difficulty with your analysis comes at the other side of the parenthesis, where we are today, because I would say, well, if we think about Google, Google's a great example, we might think about a shift from the algorithmic, the notion of a precise, calculable, fixable, stable mathematical order, to something like the algorithmic, which is processual, which works in the world of the computer, 
It's an old term, Euclid uses it, but it never really gets deployed very effectively until the coming of the computer, the ability to process. The algorithmic is not about certainty or fixity, it's about a formula. It's about the, 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 the procedural in a certain way. And Google's a great example of that because they change the algorithm, I don't know, twice a day or twice a week or something to keep everyone guessing about what's really gonna come up. You can't game it, you can't predict it. Um, Photosynth would be a great counterpart to three-point perspective. Photosynth with its melding and morphing of hundreds of photographs into one sort of seething space. There is no point of view. Hey, uh, Heidegger's notion of the, the, the world picture is, is, is shattered, is destroyed there. There is no subject-object relationship that's discernible. That was the project of the 15th century onwards, but we don't have that anymore. And it's not in the same way that it was embodied before the 15th. We could talk about it with something like the project of the encyclopedia, which, which works very well in the, in the era of print. But Wikipedia is something where your contributions are there, but constantly being repositioned by an algorithm. So I would argue that by, argue, by talking about a parenthesis, what you, what, what's occluded there is the computational, the era that we're in that allows a very different order of, the, and in fact, the algorithmic, which is something that starts to intervene between us, between the subject and the object. There's a principle, there's a process, there's a formula there that often we don't see, but that actually is doing the mediation between us and the phenomenon that we, that we encounter at the end. Okay, well, well thanks very much. I'll, sure. I'll take that on board. A lot of the terms you use seemed quite encouraging. Uh, interactive, decentric, processual, and things being, uh, being mixed up together. Uh, I've used art a bit, thinking about art and, and pictures and so on. Uh, I've, a point I've noticed is that there's a change in the, there is a change in the way the body is represented uh, in art. In, in, in connection with this, with the opening of the, of the parenthesis, uh, for example, the, the, the body of Christ in, in the crucifixion, uh, that does. Yeah, you were talking about embodiment in abstract terms, but I'm, I'm still thinking of very much of it, uh, the actual body in the picture, uh, and um, which is where I feel more at home. Uh, the actual representation of bodies shifts in the late Middle Ages and going into the 16th century. For example, the body, the body of Christ. Uh, was originally very angular. The body was almost uh, coordinate with the cross, with the, uh, the limbs following exactly the shape of the cross, so that the, 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 the body is articulate. The body is a conjunction of limbs and joints. And then as we move, as well, there's a correspondence, as, as we move into the period where, as it happens, books are being printed uh, and, and becoming more important, uh, then the body of Christ takes on a, a, a more enveloping shape that we get a, a greater, em the body sags away from the cross, uh, a greater emphasis on, on the rib cage as a, as a, as a, hollow, a hollowing out uh, envelope, uh, the, uh, the belly sags, and there's a, no a notion of, of the body being penetrable uh, and of um, essences coming out of the body. There's a, there's a shift there. Uh, and that, that business of th those portraits of uh, Renaissance women with those distended bellies. There was a kind of, there was kind of a, a fashion for presenting women with, um, with, with, with very sort of protuberant stomachs uh, at this time. And it doesn't seem, it wasn't because they were pregnant, it wasn't because uh, they were sort of standing in a particular way, I don't think, uh, but because that's just, that's just how the female body beca became to be seen. Uh, for a while, uh, I can I can respond I can respond to you in terms of actual bodies rather than processes of embodiment, uh, and I shall need to explore further the points that you were making about uh, arithmetic and, and algorithms and, and, and the like. But thank you, thank you. I will, I've explored that. Hi, uh, thanks very much for your talk, I, Ian Condre and CMS. Uh, it's very interesting, I, I have to say, the Gutenberg parenthesis is a concept that's uh, been stuck with me for the last few weeks I've been thinking about it. And I, I like the idea that there's something about oral culture uh, that can tell us something new about today. I mean, I was thinking, well, it's certainly true if we think of how gossip works. Uh, doesn't that seem similar to some of the things that happen online, the kind of communication and the way that it's sort of information plus a social relationship, right? You choose to join this or that stream of things coming through. 
Um, but, you know, as, 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 as there's also sort of an ephemerality, I think, to oral culture that we're sort of returning to with digital culture as we lose all of our photos uh, all of a sudden <laughs> and are reminded of the, the, the way storage is, is tricky. But one of the things, I guess my question, though, is it's related to, to Williams in the sense that, uh, you know, that how do we see what comes after the parenthesis, right? And that if orality, if the medieval present is an image beforehand and then print and then the internet uh, is the process we're trying to talk about, it seems to me that uh, with the medieval present, a peasant trying to say something, right, he's sort of limited to who can hear from the soapbox, right, in the middle of the town square. Uh, and that one of the things print enabled was uh, getting that, that opinion, that voice uh, across a much greater distance, right? There's a different kind of permanence and a different kind of mobility uh, that comes with print. And it, it seems to me that one way to read then this next step is a quantum leap in exactly that same print kind of thing. Uh, that there's even greater mobility, um, and instead of being constrained by the package, uh, it's easy to copy and, and multiply. So sort of mobility and multiplicity is sort of what comes with the internet. Um, and so in that sense, it seems to me, uh, uh, I'm not sure, right? Or if, if it's a maybe it's a more open parenthesis or a bracket at the other end. I'm not sure uh, that it's w the previous then goes with the, the forward. Um, and so I guess my question is, you know, uh, in what sense, if, if you could give us more of a sense of how uh, this understanding of orality and the medieval pre peasant uh, can give us a greater sense of what's happening uh, in media today. Uh, maybe there's uh, some other examples. I mean, I just categories and boundaries going down, but where, where can we see that, I guess, what I'd That's like right. to hear. That's right. There's a phrase I should have introduced into my presentation, perhaps uh, it wasn't there. Uh, the post-parenthetical period is a, a reversion to the pre-parenthetical at a higher level of technology. So we've got, to, we've got to take that into account. There are, there are going to be aspects of this which are print, which will, be, which will take print to a higher level. They'll be taking, taking the, some of the advantages of print to a higher level. Uh, but in so doing, they will undermine other aspects of print, like the permanence of print, like the, uh, like the stability uh, of, of, of the message, uh, which will take us back to the the uh, the pre the preprint period it isn't yes it isn't just a question of as i said before of uh, a preprint orality coming back in the form of a postprint orality uh, it is in the form of text but texts are changing texts are texts are getting out of control Te texts are becoming free uh, and they are escaping from the confines uh, of the book it may well be that there will be more texts. Any one text will be multiplied more. Any, any one, and I mean text rather than speech, any one text will be multiplied as a text and be more mobile as a text uh, than texts were previously, uh, but uh, in becoming mobile and in, and in being multiplied, it will become less stable. It will be free for any, any, the person who mediates it can change it, add to it, subtract from it, Make it, make it their own. Texts are becoming mobile. Texts are becoming fluid as a, as a part of that process. And the other part of it, well, think, thinking, of the, thinking of the medieval peasant, the medieval peasant was also mobile, of course. He could go, he could go from one village to another. The, 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 perform, the spreader of a rumor, let's not say a peasant, and let's say a, a carter, uh, could take his rumor from one village to another and spread it on to another group of people. It was, say, it was mobile in that sense, and probably the rumor probably changed each time. Each time he told it, uh, just as things will change every time they get repeated on the internet from 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 from, from one site to another. I like. I'm, I'm grateful for the reference to to categories, though, because I've, I've been thinking about the implications of all this for. Um, well, for the spread of news and the spread of rumor and so on. And I think that is one way. The medieval peasant probably had different sources of information, different kinds of version, different rumors came to him in different ways. Uh, but I'm not certain he had a hierarchy of trust in those different sources. In the meantime, we have had a hierarchy. We've had a period, well, I don't know, I think where we've said, well, it must be true, I read it in a newspaper that print has conferred authority 
on certain kinds of news. Uh, but now we're going back to the medieval situation where we can't really tell. Newspapers are becoming more like rumor in the sense that they are, they are being they're made available in the same kind of sources, the same kind of uh, media as rumors. Uh, it's, it is harder. I mean, it is now harder for us to, to tell what we read in a newspaper. Is it a rumor? And when we hear a rumor, is it, is it with the same authority as newspapers? They, there's a, the, category, the category of unofficial medium, of informal medium, and the category of official medium uh, is breaking down. And we are, so we, we, are, we are losing that hierarchy. Our categories of news are breaking down. And I, I see that as a very much a reversion. To, 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 we can't sort them out. We're going through a, a confusing period. Yeah. Can I soon talk about Shakespeare? All right, OK. Sorry. Um, hi, I'm Nick Siever. I'm a grad student in comparative media studies. And I have a question about, um, well, about one of the images that you showed, actually, which was the enraged musician. Because I think it has interesting um, can we, can we ramifications. That yeah, that'd be great. It's on the handout. Yeah. <laughs> Can we go back to my pictures? Is it at all possible? Yeah. Is, it, is it on the handout? It is on the handout. Oh, sorry, yeah. then, no, forget it. Handout. Okay. Um, well, so the question is sort of about, about history and about yeah. period making. Because so there's a lot of you know, yeah. things that start yeah. happening at roughly the same yes. time, yes. as you mentioned. Yes. And, yes. of course, what's implied in here is that these things also happen in particular places and not in other places. The parenthesis is around you know, the musician inside, not around the people outside. And so right. in a certain sense, right. I think it was implicit in some of what you said, that the future comes at different times to different, to different people. And I, and I have a question about how useful it is maybe to think about this, con this t period of containment in such a contained way as if everyone at one time yes. is doing the same thing. Um, there's a sense of which, um, I know we're talking, William brought up this big picture, little picture question, and this is certainly related, but it seems like uh, bracketing off this historical period uh, does blurs over some other kinds of bracketing that might happen, for example, in this image of class, but of race and gender and all of these yes. other sort of yes. containments that we might do. I was just curious about your response. To I'm, I'm very, that. thank you very much for asking that question and for drawing our attention to this picture because I went very lightly and very confusedly over it in my strangely wired condition. Uh, and uh, there's, more to, yeah, there's more to be said about this, and this also helps me uh, to emphasize, you've reminded me to emphasize a point which could have been, again, could have been made more, more clearly. It's the question of the incidence, of the timing. Uh, different cultures enter the parenthesis at different times and will exit, presumably, at different times. Within any one culture, different subcultures will enter the parenthesis at different times. So at any one moment, there'll be people inside and people outside. And Hogarth's uh, enraged musician, I've always found that a very good way of thinking, making me think about what's going on, because uh, this is, the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a Hogarth's way of saying that uh, some forms of art are becoming parenthetical. Uh, his, the, the musician in the window uh, is the Italian leader of the Covent Garden Orchestra. And the point, the point Hogarth, not, not in my terms, of course, but the point Hogarth is making is that there is a growing wall between the fine arts and the street. And this isn't healthy. And I, I, see, I see that as one of the, those parallel developments to the, uh, the opening of the, of the parenthesis. So that is, that is quite, that is quite correct. Uh, the, that musician is well in the parenthesis. Could I just make the point, in case you check, I've reversed the picture. Because Ho Hogarth didn't realize that there was a parenthesis, so he, he, put the <laughs> he put the street on the right. I had to turn, I had to, it took me hours. I had to turn it around uh, to get it the right way. Uh, the point, the, but you see, the point is that uh, it's about music and words. So within the parenthesis, we have the, we have the opera musician who you can just see is playing his music from a printed score and who will be producing, performing in opera in a confined opera house to which only the elite have, uh, have access and only the people who have the right taste and the right money have access. And even the blind ballad singer in the street outside, uh, she is singing songs, but she's also selling songs which are printed. And she's selling them as, as commodities. These are, these are broadside ballads. Uh, so we have, if you like, we have a, an elite culture and a form of commercial popular culture. Uh, I do wish Hogarth had put the blind ballad singer sort of 
a bit to the left. So he's not quite as far into the parenthesis as the, as the, as the singer. But this, this is precisely the point. While some parts of culture are getting themselves confined and cut off and becoming culture with a capital C and becoming physically confined into dedicated venues like opera houses, uh, between them there is a fence and a wall uh, be between them and the world of what Hogarth is saying, natural music, real music, folk music, the music with energy, the music of the street, and he's saying that uh, that will be to the detriment, that we will get a refined, uh, sort of, a, a too refined, a too refined artistic music which is losing contact with its roots in the street. So, the, so in one and the same period in London, there are, there are parenthetical people and there are pre-parenthetical people. And there's only the window between them. They are losing, they are losing touch with each other. Marty. Uh, this is Marty Marks from uh, the music section. Thank you both very much, all of you. I mean, I think this is really brilliant, this discussion. But I have to ask, um, why parentheses? Mm. Why not dashes or ellipses? And in, but the reason I'm saying that is because uh, w at certain points, every time you spoke about another, you went in another direction, I kept thinking how f f fertile that was. For example, the, the fragment versus the closed yeah. work. And as I've always thought about the history of European intellectuals and so forth, I've always thought that the Romanticism was already the rebellion against confinement that was ultimately defined by the Enlightenment, that in a sense, the culmination of your move, your representation of confinement, is the Enlightenment encyclopedia as the summum bonum of, of the co collection of knowledge. But, and the Romantics revel in fragments. The Romantics in music, in poetry, I mean, I'm, my area is music, but I know that in other areas too. Look at, look at the great Wojciech, by Buchner, for example, of 1820s, which is nothing but fragments. And um, how, f how that was, in a sense, part of the, the revolution against rationality. So the only reason I bring that up is, and I'm hoping Pete could, have, could talk, and then you just mentioned the broadside ballad, and I was thinking, well, why doesn't Pete talk about newspapers and ballad and broadsides? Because they were just as much a part of the culture of print in the Shakespeare's day as were books or quartos, if not more. And then, of course, I'm thinking about Aristotle, who's the beginning, and isn't, isn't the Renaissance's uh, impetus towards confinement and categorization based on their rediscovery of Aristotelian texts. But when we look at it that way, when we look at it in terms of the, per, the infinite malleability of the human intellect to go in different directions at the same time, towards confinement and escape, um, towards the divine and the real, the concrete, towards the natural and the supernatural. When we look at it that way, what does it really have to do with media, except perhaps on the grandest scale of Ong's idea of orality and print, or orality and written culture? He doesn't really talk about print culture. He talks about orality and written culture, which is not quite the same thing. So. If we, but if we extend it in one direction towards Aristotle, this debate, this, this, this opening up of the parenthesis, and we defend, extend it in another direction by breaking down the parenthesis in the 19th century rather than the 20th, how do we rate, relate that to the media scheme that we're talking about? New media, old media, pre-old media, old, old, old media, and so forth. I don't, I don't see how it all fits together, and I think the word parenthesis is itself such a confining concept that you are in fact recapitulating the argument that you're trying to undermine or something. I'm, I'm, this is all the, my thoughts at this point. I don't know how you're going to deal with that as a question. <laughs> he asked you to say something first. I oh, okay, I will say something. Uh, I don't know much about ballads and broadsides, but I can refer people with uh, complete confidence to the work of uh, Tiffany Stern at Oxford on an ephemeral paper in Shakespeare's time, and it's astounding. I mean, so the, the world of London that she describes is one in which every conceivable surface is, it has a bill. What do they say? Post no bills. They posted bills, you know, every place. And uh, these could be bills for advertising a performance 
of a play. They could be just dozens of things, advertisements. But they were, they were everywhere, and she's documented this. So we have, uh, I, and as, as I contrasted in my mind, the wonderful Olivier film of Henry V. There's a single playbill that uh, falls from the sky and then becomes the screen in the credits, for opening credits, you know. But, uh, but, uh, but it's notable that it's just a single one. And the picture that she's describing is that a kind of free paper, unbound paper, unlicensed paper, right? Unregulated paper, fraudulent paper, paper that contained rumors, was was everywhere in um, in London in 1600. That uh, that's one data little data micro point. Another would be uh, a little bit later. There are uh, we were talking about rumor. Uh, the uh, Gabriel Naudet's book on the uh, discovery of the uh, egregious impostures of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. In 1625, Renaud Day was uh, the librarian of Richelieu, an important figure in, in, in that history. And one of the, th one of the chapters of uh, the book on the Rosicrucians is about how rumors, he said there were three dangerous, this is a common trope, there were three dangerous um, inventions in our time, by which he means back to 1450 or so, uh, gunpowder and uh, the printing press and uh, I forgot the other one, but it must have been pretty dangerous. But uh, 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 <laughs> something obvious. But anyway, but the printing press and the printing press, because any uh, any uh, uh, crazy person with an idea about overthrowing the state could get a bunch of leaflets uh, printed. Um, rumors about miraculous events could um, could uh, could thrive in a way that go beyond carting them individually from one place to another. So this sort of un idea that the printing press unloosed, unlicensed, irrational, um, illicit paper is, is a part of the Shakespearean picture. Um, and, I mean, they're, they're just amazing scenarios that she has of descriptions of the, uh, the lady of a house uh, that was rich enough to have servants would send out a servant in the morning to rip all the paper off that she might be interested in right, off of the walls and off of the posts and bring it home in a pile and the lady of the house would then peruse it. That, that was the newspaper, right? And of course, then, then it had to be pasted back up uh, by somebody else, so they had to keep, keep doing the rounds to keep the city properly pasted over. But we don't have that idea of London when we go or, or you know, when, we, when we go to a tourist village uh, like uh, um, Stratford or Oxford or Cambridge. You know, uh, when we have old buildings, we think of them as un, un, uh, unencumbered uh, and un, by graffiti or by pasted up uh, paper, but they were. So that, that is just a couple of things. I, uh, but broadsides would be a very important part of, of this. Like to, um, yeah. Just make one, uh, uh, one observation here. Um, the, the idea of a parenthesis is very provocative, I find. Interesting for making us think before and after. But the idea that we are moving to a post-literate society is very hard for me to uh, understand because the entire technological framework that makes this media, uh, this immersion media culture possible is super literate. It it's, depends on vast amounts of uh, uh, commentary, uh, more publications than we in the humanities can even imagine. Uh, these uh, regimes are used constantly. And I would also note that the, uh, the people who inhabit the realms of, the, of, of uh, social media and, so, and all the different areas of uh, popular culture are themselves super literate. They are constantly writing. They are constantly uh, communicating with each other through texts. Uh, the level of understanding of the word is uh, probably beyond anything it's ever been. So the notion of the parenthesis that we are actually returning to a preliterate society, I think needs to be modified somewhat by saying, well, it's, it's not either or, it's both and. What we are actually merging into is something that is both a new uh, uh, secondary orality that is massively supported by a super literacy. And so 
we have to deal with that because that's not easy to deal with. Because, uh, but I think this this idea of parenthesis may be giving us uh, the wrong kind of emphasis. That you know we're returning to something that was before. I don't think that past is ever going to be recovered. But elements of it and experiences of it, of course, can. But supported by something that is uh, fundamentally, it's it's a little like. Uh, Sometimes I think of Wells and uh, the Eloy and the Morlocks. You know, the Morlocks are down there, you know, grinding out and creating this uh, possible uh, culture, and then the uh, Eloy are on the top. But uh, that's not really what's happening. It's it's, it's something that's uh, more complicated. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. I, I, I'll just take take a response to that and perhaps say a word or two in in defence of the parenthesis as an image. But your aunt, the answer was in what you said, in the sense that the users of the new media are super literate uh, and they are all writing. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. In the parenthesis, there are writers and readers. Mm -hmm. There are a few writers and many readers. Uh, and the new age is one in which you can't really tell the difference between a reader and a writer because they are all they are all writing. They are all writing and communicating with the same freedom that before the princess they were all speaking. We are reproducing with texts the kind of fluidity, the interaction, and the declining categories, the, the breakdown in categories between the creator and the receiver, and the consumer, uh, that, that was there with speech. We, we, it's, I, I, Ong was getting close to it. I, I think Ong, uh, in his notes for this, uh, a new edition of uh, his work that never came out, uh, was starting to think about a secondary literacy, yeah. uh, a new kind of literacy which was uh, say, so widespread and so easily acceptable that people, yes, people were writing to each other uh, with the same freedom and the same ease and in the same syntax uh, as they spoke to each other uh, previously before before the parenthesis. And with regard to the parenthesis itself, uh, it's certainly, I mean, it's provocative. It's, more, it's good it's provocative, if, if you like. That's one of its good points, because it's, it's better than dashes or series of dots, because it insists on a return. Dashes, there, can be, there can be several sort of dashes uh, in a sequence. The, pre the parenthesis uh, is such a provocative way of saying there was this pause, one idea was going forward, we stopped, we left that for a moment, went into another idea, and then we came back to the first idea. It's, like, it's not going backwards, it's not, perhaps I'm wrong to say we're going to be like now. medieval mm. peasants, uh, but uh, we are resuming where we left off. We were moving forward at a certain point, then we stopped and did something else, and now we are re we're reverting to where we were and moving on beyond that. And it's appropriate, as I just managed to say, I think, uh, in that the parenthesis itself is a... Um, uh, a Renaissance uh, invention, an invention within 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 the world of within the world of print. And with regard to Aristotle uh, and the rediscovery of classical notions, uh, I made this point when I was here the first time talking about this, and I still think it's right, although it gets rid of Gutenberg. Cultures can move in and out of this kind of parenthesis through the years. A given culture can start to drift in towards the parenthesis. Uh, which I think is what happened in the classical period, in, in, in the Greco-Roman classical period. There was a kind of a, it was like ice ages. Uh, there was a mini ice age, uh, a mini textual age in the classical period where, where writing was becoming more dominant, but without the advantage of print, and then we moved out of it again in the, in the Middle Ages, and the Renaissance rediscovered it. Can I make one last point about fragments? Romance fragments. It is quite right that romance writing was a kind of bid for freedom in writing fragments and not being confined by the rules and by the conventions. But I bet they did it on purpose. I bet it was self-conscious. It wasn't their default mode. Fragments and incompleteness are the default mode before the parenthesis and may be it again after the parenthesis. A deliberate revolt against convention and confinement in itself is anac it's rather like the Bactinian uncontained body. You can't, you can't, you can't have your Bactinian carnivalesque rebellion against the contained body unless your the norm is the contained body. So rom I, I would have thought the ro romantic romantic fragments, romantic fragmentation is self-conscious fragmentation, which in a way acknowledges that the norm 
is containment, is completeness, is, is, is closure. There's a, there's a, oh, yeah. Pete, you have another? No, no, sorry. I think we should. Go ahead. Um, my name is Les Perlman. I'm writing a humanistic studies. And several lifetimes ago, I was a medievalist. Um, and I just actually wanted, um, as I was standing up here, I was actually going to make the same kind of point that Jim made. And I'd like to sort of give some concrete examples that parentheses doesn't seem to be the right thing because it seems to be same but different in, in very, very different ways. For example, hierarchy. The Middle Ages was very big on hierarchy. Uh, the internet, if anything, is very flat. Um, I think the difference between production and consumption, that oral tradition, you needed to have production everywhere or else you would not have, you know, you, if you wanted a play in your town, if you wanted to have a mystery play, you put it on. You know, the various guilds put it on. If I want to see something now, I can just go to YouTube. Um, the fact is that many more people can produce, but you don't necessarily have to produce. You can just consume much more than you could always consume before with many more choices. And, you know, another one last point I'd like to make is with the whole idea of containment and hypertext. Um, in the Middle Ages, not so much in the oral tradition, but in the book tradition, was the whole idea of the hypertext, the incipient notion of the hypertext in the Ovid Moralize and in the Talmud. And those things only become really viable now in the digital age. Yes, yes. I would, I would see that as compatible with the parenthesis if we acknowledge that the parenthesis is multiple uh, comprising several sort of calibrated uh, or a, a broad fuzzy parenthesis uh, and, and that um, some forms of textual communication, I, I like the notion of the, um, the text which is commented, the text which carries its own comments uh, and that we are, I, I, I'm, I'm happy about that uh, in the sense that uh, the, the way in modern times we can, we can freely comment on and adjust a text uh, is taking us back not merely to the era of speech, but to a manuscript era, uh, in the sense that uh, with a manuscript, it's oh, when you're speaking, it's hard to distinguish between the like the, the authoritative voice and the voice that interrupts. Uh, and with writing, you can, as as with uh, sort of authoritative manuscripts. Uh, you can have the scribal text, and then you can have the annotations and the marginal comments, uh, and they can look as authoritative, especially when the manuscript's copied, they can look as authoritative. Uh, they, they differ in degree rather than in kind uh, from the, the main text. And then with the printed book, you can jolly well see that, that you, you distinguish between the, uh, the text itself, which is printed, and then the annotations are clearly in hand, and they belong to a different, a different category. Uh, of, of, of communication. So it's certainly that part I think I can, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with. Thanks very much. Mary Fuller from the literature section. So one of the things that I kept thinking really if almost from the beginning of your talk was that I didn't recognize in early modern books the kind of book that you were talking about, the sort of the autonomous, the enclosed, the bordered, and so on and so forth. Um, what I did recognize was an idea of the book that, as Pete was saying, dates back. Certainly, you know, one finds it in the 80s and, and earlier decades. But it strikes me that, in some sense, it's a very modern idea of the book and a very modern practice of the book and practice of reading the book. I don't recognize it in the early modern texts that I work with, which are compilations of put together by the editor, sort of effectively hyperlinked to all kinds of contexts outside the book, the including or, or the owner? by the editor. Okay. Compilations made by the editor, very popular kind of book, annotated by the editor, annotated by readers, used in practice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, sort of agglomerations of things that only don't look like networks if we don't understand the kind of books they are, but that's an effect of our readership of them, of our loss of the local context. And so, you know, and, and then it, you know, as I was sitting, I had a lot of time to think about this as I was sitting on the steps. 
this is making me really sort of distrust the larger narrative of the parenthesis as an interruption, which at the same time you have moved away from sort of repeatedly and said, well, actually, it's much more mobile and local and people come in and out of it and so on and so forth. It strikes me that, you know, my ability to work with these early modern books in the way that I have the last few years is effectively being networks sort of full of hyperlinks and so on and so forth is very much a function of the moment, the historical moment at which I'm doing that work, because I think that perspective wasn't, wouldn't have been available 30 years ago. Right? And so I th it seems to me that the digital era has reactivated certain kinds of lost potential in the Gutenberg age that were never not there, but were not seen by us for a period, just as it seems to be reactivating certain kinds of lost potential in the manuscript and oral age. Um, so I can't make that into a question, but I'll just leave it but to you to respond as you wish. You say early modern books. Does it, is it a transitional phenomenon, or does it carry on into the 18th, 19th centuries? You were saying it's more... I, I, I think that's fair enough that the Gutenberg parenthesis is, is cumulative and, and sort of increases in depth or increases in um, intensity as time goes by, so that it'll take some time to get to the time of the kind of book I'm imagining. Uh, and I like the I, I like I, I like that it's rather cor correspond rather to what what Pete, Peter was saying that uh, the digital age is helping us to find things that were there that we couldn't really see before or handle before uh, in in uh, in earlier periods. But is it? Uh, do you get these compilations in the 19th century? Do they, they just carry on? I don't work in the 19th okay. century, so right. I couldn't really say. Okay. I wouldn't want to say that okay. they don't occur okay. then. All right. Okay. Um, but there's, I mean, it's, 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 going, it's going to be varied, it's going to be muddled, it's going, it's going, it's going to be transitional. But no, I mean, that, well, th but thank you for, a, I've been waiting to thump this book into the table uh, for quite some time now. What I mean by that, the kind of contained book, is this one. This is, it's a facsimile. This is what they did to Shakespeare. Shakespeare's plays, which were designed for performance, and Shakespeare's plays, which weren't terribly original all the time, Shakespeare's plays, which were, in some cases, rewrites of existing plays, and which deployed traditional materials in traditional ways, and Shakespeare's plays, which were themselves subjected to enormous uh, intervention uh, by the actors, and which were taken around from place to place and performed by the actors, not always very uh, uh, accurately, those living plays, that living, pre-parenthetical, uncontained uh, culture of highways and junctions, textual highways and junctions and real highways and junctions, it was imprisoned. Uh, well, thank heavens, because otherwise we wouldn't have the plays. But we, we can just say thank you, th thank you, but goodbye uh, to the... Uh, the printers. This is it. I mean, say so this. This is a facsimile, uh, but this will this will be something like it. All of, it's it's a book. It's considered to be the complete works, complete plays, of an author, and all the plays are complete. All the plays are claimed to be in better, more authentic versions uh, than had been available uh, individually previously. And here it is. Uh, it, all these, say all the, 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 t the text. The text is within its margins, with a very, a very careful line around the, uh, the text to make sure the words don't start sort of crawling out uh, of the page. Uh, and then, say, printed in that press. The pages are folded into gatherings and stitch. The gatherings are stitched together, and the, the, the volume uh, is then glued. Uh, and uh, given covers, and the, cover, the covers are stitched together or glued together, and the book is put into its case, and Shakespeare and his living world is carefully encapsulated, and then what do you get? I mean, thank you for this, uh, this chance of fetishization, the, the, the fetishistic approach. Once you've turned Shakespeare into a thing, you can start to relate to it in, a not, in a, a, an other than textual manner. And I've had great pleasure over the years, in, and I've brought you a small sample from my collection uh, of slightly unhealthy ad advertisements for, for Shakespeare's plays. Uh, if you go... The Oxford Complete Works. I have an advertisement for the leather-bound edition 
of the Oxford Shakespeare Complete Works, an exquisite edition, bound, bound in dark green leather, with gilt-edged pages, and with a sort of a special birth, a special um, Shakespeare stamp. Uh, I have the again another version of the Oxford Shakespeare the Complete Works. Um, Shakespeare's Complete Works in exquisite blue calfskin. And then this is the Arden, the Arden Complete Works, bound in genuine maroon leather with gold embossed title lettering, marbled end papers, and a ribbon marker. Exquisitely presented volume that will appeal to book collectors and Shakespeare lovers throughout the world. They're not, yeah. suppo they're not supposed to read it, they're just supposed to uh, look at it, <laughs> stroke it. Mary Hopper, years ago, been around <laughs> CMS and whatnot. Um, I te first, I'll say I'm a little biased. I tend to be dubious about the use of the uh, parentheses. It's a bit artificial since the, con I think there's more continuity in the forces that came before and during are continuous and always there and in parallel all the time in different percentages and proportions, but they're continuous now and past and it will be in the future. Also, I think media history tends to be that one form of media doesn't replace another as much as it tends to be continuous and additive. So the books will continue and the forces of the books. People will make their e-book readers hold just a single book and contain it very carefully. And storage will continue to improve to the point where it will be uh, long-term and permanent. So it's not that it's just going to go away. But you did mention that in the pr if you do use the parentheses, and you get to the point where you say, okay, well, what comes after is different. You have said you do know that what comes after will be forever impacted by what is inside the parentheses. So even if you use them, I'm just curious, how would you represent what comes after as being impacted by what came within? Have you thought about what you would do to make it quite clear that what is after has been forever changed by what is inside the parentheses? Do you mean in what I say or in the imagery that I use? I'm a visual so person, so probably in the imagery, but even if it's just in the language, yes. But I think, I think say, the, pre the parenthesis in itself suggests that, uh, in that it, it, it invites a, a syntactical uh, analogy, in that the say, sentences are changed when they... But the other, in term, in simply in terms of words, as I've said previously, that we, it's, a, it's a reversion to where we were, or a carrying on from where we left off, but at a higher level of technology. Uh, and... I'm trying to, uh, I haven't succeeded yet, in, perhaps I need a three-dimensional diagram uh, to try and in indicate that the, the, the matter of time, because it does, just having the one parenthesis on the page looks like we all do it at the same time, and it's, it's complete and total. That's the worst thing about the parenthesis. One, one of my diagrams had two, I noticed, uh, just, just as a symbolic indication that they, there are multiple parentheses, so... Um, on one side and a colon on the other, or something like that. Yeah, so one can I've, get out. I've Stuff been, can get out one side. I've, I've been using three kinds of brackets in some of my some of my material. That I've used a round bracket and a square bracket and, and one of those squiggly ones. That the, it needs. I, I need if you're if you're visual. I, I I need some way to multiply the lines to multiply the uh, the simple the lines representing change. And I also need I also need some means. Uh, to indicate the, the, the time factor that not, not all not all things happen at the same time. Uh, with regard to the continuity, sorry, I've, I've been thinking about continuity. Um, you're quite right, and I'm, I'm very much aware of that. That every time something new is introduced, uh, what's there, most of it, carries on. I've been thinking a lot about that, uh, and, and well, for example, uh, print itself comes on, in, on top of and in addition to the written book. And in many ways, the printed book doesn't, qualitatively, doesn't do a lot more. There's not much difference between a printed book and a written one, in that sense, in the quality sense. But um, it struck me that but surely it, it is, must be relevant that there are just so many more of them. So what, whatever, it is, whatever it is a book does, print multiplies quantitatively, so it'll, it'll, it'll have a greater impact. It was some, something that was there already. It, be, it becomes endemic. It becomes, it becomes much bigger, so it can, it can contribute in that way. I think we are running short. I'm going to leave the last comment to Pete. Uh, and uh, thank you all for a very stimulating conversation. And yeah, I, I just wanted to suggest
a little to the idea that Shakespeare would have shared the devaluation of the book because the evidence is uh, the contrary. Uh, uh, as wonderful a dramatist as Shakespeare was, there's a strong anti-theatrical uh, element to his art. Uh, and the stage doesn't always, isn't always portrayed as a place of truth and, uh, you know, it, it, it's often uh, portrayed negatively. And if, for instance, in um, a sonnet where he speaks of, uh, my nature is subdued almost to what it works in, like the dyer's hand. So, you know, the, 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 the profession of being a playwright uh, is subduing his nature. And then he goes on to say, public manners, public uh, sins beget, or something like that. I forget exactly what it is. But the idea is that his profession of writing for the public stage is degrading. And, and so, you know, this is, this is part of the portrait of Shakespeare. Not that it was all that he thought, obviously not. You know, uh, it's not to say that's the whole story, but it's a part of the story. And another is that there's a, 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 a lot of evidence that uh, Shakespeare um, was confined by the stage uh, rather than by the book. And some of this is in Lucas, Lucas Ern's arguments in Shakespeare, the dramatic artist, uh, the dramatic literary artist, I forget the exact title, Lucas Ern at Geneva. And, uh, it, it, this is just one example of it, but I think a very telling one. So a play like Henry V, which has been read as uh, a pacifist play, as a radical play, as a radical uh, uh, reproach to authority, to war, to uh, the state, and so on, in the 20th century, um, and as, uh, as often as an authoritarian play and a, and a hero play, uh, but the, the grounding of the reading of Henry V as radical in some measure comes entirely from, almost entirely from parts of the play uh, that, were, that are in the folio and not in the quarto because the public stage was more, uh, more assiduously censored. So, uh, for example, I mean, I'll th think of one example, but it's many ways in which the war against France is relativized and called into question, is done by the work of the chorus who pops up between each act and who is entirely absent in the quarto that was published during Shakespeare's life and it was likely to be closer to performance than the folio version. Or the passage in the fourth chorus where uh, he's comparing Henry, uh, King Henry returning in triumph to London and, and uh, to the arrival of, of a noble general, Essex, from Ireland, uh, bringing rebellion, broached on his sword, a line that hovers between having defeated, or maybe he'll defeat the Irish rebels, but also maybe as actually happened in real life and for which he was executed, he brought rebellion home to London and challenged the Queen in an unsuccessful revolt against the state. So, and that's the only, uh, uh, topical reference to current events that's undoubted in the Shakespeare canon. All of that's in the folio. Uh, none of it is in, is in the quarto. So um, you do have some freedoms in print that are striking sometimes relative to uh, being hauled in for what might be performed on the public stage. Uh, so it, it can really work uh, both ways. Also, performance can be confining. The way uh, actors did their parts uh, in Shakespeare's time could be very confining because they didn't have the full play. They didn't do a read through. They didn't read the book. They had cues, their parts, and the cue in part, and cue in part. So the freedom of the performer was, we would have thought, uh, severely limited, you know, to, and textually directed. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't free. And uh, as Tom, of course, knows, there was criticism in Shakespeare's plays of the, of the freedom of the stage. Uh, uh, of the clown saying more in, in Hamlet and so on, of that period outside the parenthesis. Or later, uh, you'll, you'll get the notion that, that uh, after the restoration, that there's an authority in performance just as there's a, 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 a confining authority uh, in print. The confining authority in print comes from what's on the page. The confining authority from performance consists in the need to establish that um, um, a Betterton, for example, the, the, the leading actor of the time, had learned his part in Hamlet from so-and-so who'd learned it from Francis Taylor, who'd learned it from the author. You know? And there's, a, and there's a, a great deal of attention to creating these genealogies of performance authority 
that go back just as the fetishized book does to the notion of the controlling author. So I don't think there's a panacea in performance or you know, that, that one of these forms is uh, necessarily uh, um, only confining and another liberating. It's a complicated story in Shakespeare's case. I think that the case is pretty good that he was both a literary artist as well as a um, theatrical professional. Well, and uh, lest we forget, every age invents its own forms of confinement. We now have copyright, and the internet is a perfect, uh, perfect realm for it. So uh, we still work with these things. But thank you very much for a very stimulating conversation. <laughs>